Hey guys, Charlie here. Welcome back to another episode of that Worship Guitar Show. Uh, we're already at episode 13, so um, kind of crazy how time flies when uh, we get started. But it's really been great seeing everyone tune in every week and watching the replays and getting some value out of these lessons. So um, we see Jeff Miller, one of our Academy students, uh, tuning in from Michigan. Hey Jeff, great to see you. And um, for everyone else tuning in, uh, please let us know if you can hear my voice, hear the guitar, and then we are going to get cracking right away. And we've got Yaku watching as well. Um, all of the awesome designs you guys see on our thumbnails and everything else coming down the line. Uh, Yaku is uh, the wizard behind all of our designs there. So Yaku tuning in and Kenan saying audio is all good. Fantastic. There's nothing quite as bad as getting started and then realizing something was um, <laughs> uh, muted or not working. So um, kind of a customary thing just to do whenever you go live to get going there. And Rob Pluch saying looking sick and Jeff Miller saying good to be here. Sounds great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, we're going to dig uh, right in. And today I want to show you as per the, the promise of our title is how do you play all over the neck? Because a lot of folks kind of get stuck in one area. And I just want to show you some cool ways in which you can play all over the neck. Uh, we've got Angelo um, saying hi and Mark from Callahan, Florida. Um, welcome guys, welcome. Really awesome to have you here. All right. One of the things I like to do about the guitar is think about it in um, kind of divide and conquer. So I like to, the two ways that I do that, and if I go to my second cam here, is just to kind of think of my strings as my low strings and my high strings, because then I can get some really cool, like if you just think about this, let's take some of that off there. Okay, great. The boost. So if that's your low sound and your high sound, you can do a lot of cool things when you break the guitar up like that. So kind of thinking like a drummer, they've got the low kick and then the high snare. So, and if I add some delay and reverb to kind of carry that a bit, it's gonna sound. That type of thing is cool. Uh, when you break the guitar up like that. And even if you were to play some kind of funky rhythms. That type of thing, it just gets you, um, it gets your guitar split up. But today I don't really want to talk about the, the bass versus the treble split. I more want to talk about um, the way that you can have your vertical world and your horizontal world. So what do I mean by that? Um, we've got Aaron Davis from Montana, Seth tuning in, Darren Grimm, and Jay saying good morning from Alabama, USA. Love the international audience we have here every week. Super, super cool. And if you guys have any questions, just let me know um, in the comment section. Happy to answer any questions around any of this stuff that we are gonna be going through and we've got Robert Kent from Houston, Texas. So yeah, we'd love for these sessions to be interactive. So let me show you my initial side uh, that we're gonna get cracking on here, which is really what I mean with vertically and horizontally. So what do I mean? If I think of a, a progression in the key of G, which is maybe a four, one, five, six, then if I think vertically, <laughs> I will play my C like that, then my G like this, the five like that, and the six like this. And then of course I can pick that. So that's kind of like a vertical world, thinking like that. But I like thinking in terms of more of a horizontal way, which is kind of a one string thing. So instead of playing C, E, G like this, I like 
like to do this. Which is the same. And for G, instead of doing, I can go. And for D, I can go. And then E minor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a quick demo when I play across the neck like this, and I'm gonna draw it for you on an iPad and we'll get into the lesson right after that. So we'll go ahead and show you. So I'm gonna fire up a track, it's a four, one, five, six in the key of G. First of all, I'll just play horizontally, sorry, not horizontally, vertically in one area, and then the second of all, I'm gonna play horizontally across the neck, check it out. So there's my one chord, oh sorry, my four chord, my one chord, the five chord, and then the six chord. So if I think horizontally or vertically, messing around there but what you guys can see is instead of being stuck in this one area like I did for the first time nothing wrong with that by the way sometimes that's all you need but sometimes you want to venture out and you want to do these additional things and play across the neck well what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly show you how that is done so if we go to this view you'll be able to still see my guitar and um like our first chord that we played was purely just a C major. So it was those three notes. And if I even just not do the notes like this, let's just do it like this. Um, to do like, a, I'll give you the actual note names. So we have C, then we have E, and then we have G. So that right there is a triad doesn't get any any more simple than that my next chord that we played was a G major so it was G D and B G D and B my next chord right I need to go ahead and just add in another note for us here so I'm gonna paste that in there and let's add one more so we can do all four chords all right perfect so let's get rid of that that's my G chord and now my next chord is a D uh, the notes there will be A, D, F sharp. Now even what I'm doing here might be uh, new for some folks because you might just be used to seeing dots all over the place, right? Instead of the actual note names. And seeing the note names is pretty important. And then our final chord was an E minor. So that was B, E, and G. So now if I cycle through these and just show you what I did. This is a C chord. C, E, G. This is a G chord. B, D, G, this is a D chord, A, D, F sharp, and this is an E minor chord, B, E, G. All right, so let's go ahead and just give us the chord names there, D major, G, and C. So that's your first port of call, is really triads. 
Um, you have to be super comfortable with your triads because that's literally the building blocks of everything you need uh, when you play worship and really any style for that matter. So now instead of playing C, E, G like this, let's go get another color uh, just to kind of make it a little bit more apparent what, what I'm doing here. So I can now get E over there and I can get G over there. So can you see C, E, G is the same as C, E, G. So already that should kind of give you a good sense of what is possible. So if we go and do say, um, and I'll change that for us in a second. Uh, let's go to the G. So instead of playing B, D, G, I can do B and then I can move my D there and I can move my G there. That is one of the beautiful things on the guitar. And I'll quickly just do this. That G and that D, those are identical. Like listen to this G and listen to this G. It's the same note. The timbre is different in terms of uh, a thin string versus a thicker string, but the note itself is the same. D versus D. And if I do this over here on my other chords, so this G, obviously that G was the one we just had. So G, G, and then E and E. Listen to that. E and E. So those notes are literally exactly the same. So what I'm going to do now, just for an exercise, I'm going to play together a track here that's just a 1-4 track. Uh, and in this case, we're going to go G and C. So let me go to my... Um, Okay, cool. I might, I'll try and swipe as I play. So let's see how that goes. Here we have G. To a C. Back to the G. C. So I'll just stop there for a second and now I won't, let's go to the back to the full guitar cam, which is this one. I'm gonna do the first one with in position with between the G and the C and then I'm gonna go across the whole neck. Let's listen to what that sounds like. Staying in position. G, C, I'll talk about that in a second, G. So can you see how that's a little bit of a different approach? And obviously these examples that I played is for teaching purposes, right? So you wouldn't play all of that stuff exactly like that on a Sunday. But that allows you to break out, out of your box because now you can actually see where all these other notes can be found. There's a C major. There's a G major. Then we didn't do the F, oh, sorry, the D 
But again, now this is where it gets interesting. The D is right there. And then the F sharp is going to be right there. All right. And then our final chord B, because that's C, D, here we're going to have the E. And then over there is the G. So this is just doing it on, on uh, the G string. So now a good exercise for you to do this. And by the way, let me know in the comment section if that's useful to kind of see how you can spread the notes across the neck because I did not use scales for any of that, um, even though those notes belong in the scales and they come from the scale. But the problem is if you have a scale-based approach, like in this case, we're in the key of G, There's a lot of notes within a scale, nothing wrong with that, but you can be more precise when you just go right after your actual chord tones. So let me know in the comment section if that's useful to kind of start seeing the neck because now you already know these triads. Most of you will know them already. Now it's just a matter of learning where you can find those exact same notes on other parts of the um, of the neck. All right, so uh, we've got uh, Godwin tuning in from Nigeria. Um, hey Godwin, great to see you. And uh, we've got uh, Seth saying, please teach me how to improvise on the whole neck during worship. I would really appreciate it. And what tone do you have? It sounds great. All right, so for the first part, if I was in a worship set, right? Um, and I'm, I thank you for asking that question because your phrasing is actually way more important than um, what you say, note-wise sometimes. So what do I mean by that? We've all heard this, the thing where people say it's not what you said, but it's how you said it, right? So it's the intention behind it. So on the guitar, the same thing works. So if, I want, if I'm going to go back to that 1-4 progression, where you just, you're going to start with like, um, let's go to the guitar. You're going to start with... See what I did there is I just picked my one note, I picked it, then I opened up my volume control, I slide up to D, and I slide up to G. Except for those open notes at the end. But let's do this again. Pick the G. Let's go to the iPad so you can see that. I'm picking the G, the B note over the G, and then I'm sliding up to the D and then sliding to the G. So I only played one note. If I wanted to play that in one position, yeah, I'd have to pick, pick, pick. So each time I pick, there's an attack on the string. And that doesn't sound so smooth. So if I do a pick, slide, slide over the same progression between G and C, listen to what that sounds like. Pick, slide, slide. Nice and gentle again. Pick, slide. Pick, slide, slide. Pick, slide, slide. Introduce some other notes. Pick, hammer, slide. And then just stay there and then pick, hammer, slide. Pick, hammer, and a slide. Pick, hammer, slide. Pick, hammer, slide again. And now I can develop that idea. Pick up our slide.
So I'm messing around, but I'm showing you, if I think on one string, it's almost like a violin player or a cello player. They can bow the notes. So without having that attack on the guitar, like if you listen to this, there's quite a lot of an attack on the string. So if you want like a gentle lead type of thing, you know, like uh, backing vocals might do oohs and ahs or a choir that might just, you know, kind of give those long legato, smooth, fluid, connected sounds, then that's what you want. You can't really do that if you are thinking like this because then you have to... You have to literally pick each note Whereas if you can start incorporating legato, which is hammer-ons, pull-offs, slides, vibrato, you can be a lot more um, musical in that particular instance. And then as you saw, I used that to kind of come up with an idea and then I added in more picks with palm muting. Again, taking away some of that harsh attack and then that was a little bit more of a rhythmic vibe going there. So, um, yeah, Seth, so that is one thing that this will help you when you start checking out how to do those kind of things. And then Rico saying, really like the tone, hi from Philippines. Thank you, Rico. Um, we've got some surprises coming for all of our uh, members. Um, as you guys know, I use a Kemper profiler. Um, don't know if you'll see it there. No, you can't see it there. But um, a Kemper is my weapon of choice, but it's been hard to um, share tones because we don't really make our own profiles. And in order to make profiles in the camper, you need the actual amps. And then we know that there's a big Line 6 community out there. So um, hopefully from as soon as next week, if not next week, the week after, we'll be able to start making some of Helix patches available that will be matched to what I'm already using on the camper. So um, be on the lookout for that. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully that, you know, can help you guys as well. So Rico is saying, always wanted to learn to play, uh, but he gets discouraged because of the way the guitar sounds and it's not properly set up. Yeah, that is a big deal in terms of the way that the guitar sounds. If it's exciting, it's going to inspire you. So what I would encourage you, Rico, is we did a video on my main tone. It's one of the fairly recent videos on our YouTube channel. But I kind of showed you my tone and I deconstructed it, everything from the compression to the boost, to the shapers, to the dual delay, the quad delay, the reverb, and um, even some additional distortion as well. So if you can watch that and kind of get a sense of those main elements, that should hopefully help you with that. And as Rico saying, I think we need to have recondition our electric guitar in our church. Yeah, it's always a good idea to... Um, to, to get a, a setup done, you know, on your guitar. So, and very importantly that you've just mentioned here um, is if I play C over here on my guitar and then this C over there, or if I play this C and that C and that C and that C, you kind of want your guitar to be in tune all over the neck. So when you get a proper setup done, it really helps you um, helps you with that. And like Rico's saying, um, yeah, learning to play guitar for God's glory, I totally agree. You know, we have the electric guitar is such a powerful sound. It's got such variety, and we can when we can learn to use that um, in a way that it serves our local church and our worship environments, that is very very important. And um, Jeff. He's saying it's very helpful for sounding more voice-like. And for me personally, um, I, I can't sing. Um, it's something I never really learned how to do. But I have a, a desire to make my voice heard, right, during worship. And so that's kind of come through the guitar. So anything that you can do to mimic the, 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 the human voice on the guitar is always a good idea. And I'll give you guys a couple of things that you can do. But like Jeff was saying, if you do stuff like...
you know there's some basic things like that to try and um, make your guitar sound like a human voice um, hammer-ons pull off slides all these things really help with that and of course singers are used to using vibrato something you don't want to overdo but um You know, it really uses that fingerprint of yours. No one else has the same fingerprint as you do. So when you learn how to um, kind of just make your notes sound like you, um, that's a great thing. And you want to use vibrato sparingly, um, but it can really help to add some character over there. So hopefully that's useful, Rico. And then um, Jeff is saying, my mistake is trying to pick every note, which sounds a little disjointed. Yeah, that is um, a common mistake, right? Because when we learn to play, our brains tell us we have to strike a string in order to get a sound. Um, but yeah, there's so much that you can do like I've done now with either slides or just hammer-ons, right? kind of things really help um hammer-ons and and one thing that i would encourage you guys to do two exercises to try and be more voice like when you're playing singers they have to kind of at some point stop singing and breathe right um and as guitarists we sometimes don't well we don't have that restriction we can keep playing you know, as long as we're picking, we can breathe while we play. We don't have to stop and breathe in order to play more notes. We can just have that going all the time. So sometimes it's good to like take a deep breath, then play what you play. And at some point, as soon as you want to kind of take a new breath, you breathe out, you're going to stop playing for that section, and then you're going to breathe and you're going to start playing again. That's one way to kind of mimic the human voice in terms of the amount of notes that you can play. So that's kind of a cool thing. Also, kind of just breathing properly when you are playing is good because sometimes we are nervous and uh, when we play on stage and our breathing might be a little bit shallow and we don't really, you know, oxygenate ourselves properly. So breathing in general when you play, even when you're nervous, just taking those nice deep breaths is a good, uh, good idea. And then using the hammer-ons and the pull-offs and the slides and the vibrato to kind of see how you can sound other notes. So for this example that I've shown you guys, it's fairly simple, but you can go and write this out on, on, on a on uh, piece of paper. So if you take, let's, we started at C. Start C, G, D, E minor. But then you want to go play the C. Same three notes. And you can even just do that as an example. Um, brain starts to hear these kind of phrases so um what did i do um so pick slide pick 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 slide pick pick up to you what you want to do with the notes once you have them down but when you start don't even have a super dirty tone like I've just done see if you can clean things up a little bit uh, maybe even remove your delays and all that kind of good stuff and then just see if you can just play the notes 
C E G C E G B D G B D G A D F sharp A D F sharp and then E B E G B E G so that's a good um thing to kind of check out if you want to learn how to do that um it's a pretty useful um process to follow to kind of learn the the you know the strings and the notes all over the neck all right so let's get to a couple more questions if you guys have them keep them coming um erin is saying i feel like i'm constantly looking for the perfect guitar for worship i've settled on a fender strat made in mexico but in the style of the 1957 there's much to learn about sound store thoughts yeah so yeah there's so many guitars you know and i've seen um you know especially in the worship side people have used strats and tellies and gretches and porridge smiths and i was even just watching a video now of a song that we playing tonight at church and it was not range of back in the day playing a gibson so at the end of the day the guitar just find a tone you like because you might have a great guitar but not like the tone or whatever so as long as you like the tone your guitar is set up properly and you kind of have your basics dialed in from the tone point of view using compression and uh, when i do these kind of a uh, things like this um All of that was just one pick, you know. I can maybe make it a bit more. This is do this. I only give it one pick. So when you have stuff like compression to kind of help your your tone to ring out a little bit longer, um obviously delay and reverb. So as long as the guitar is tuned well and when I mean tuned well not just tuned once when you play, but in tune and the intonation is set up and and it feels good, you get those basic building blocks of the tone um then that's basically just what you got to um start getting used to it so this guitar of mine this PRS I've had this I bought it second hand in 2002 I think so I've had it for over 20 years second hand so I kind of know this guitar um you know the neck the, it's been refretted once uh, when I lived in London um at Charlie Chandler's they they did a refret for me But I know my guitar well. So you know that they say the best camera out there is the one that you have on you. Right? Because um if you if you don't have the a camera to capture a moment, then it doesn't matter about, you know, what's better or not, it's about the one that you have with you. Now with a guitar, um it's the best guitar is the one that you you like to play, that you feel good about and that you can kind of get along with. You know, that will help you to um do what you need to do because if you got a single coil guitar like you saying with your 57 uh strat there you are probably going to dial up your tone to be um maybe a bit more gain to kind of make the single coils growl a little bit more um so that's just you just got to get to know your gear and then um use what you can to the best of your ability um a kind of quick story is one day I was working for a magazine called Guitar Techniques magazine in London and they used to book me to go and film guitar players um and then do an interview with them and then transcribe what they played the notes and then write a little lesson for the magazine so I, uh, through that I've met players like Joe Bonamassa, Buddy Whittington, Eric Sardinas and you know a bunch of guys Julian Large um But my favorite bow you know by by far was Joe Satriani. So Joe Satriani is a very melodic guitar player. It was kind of one of my childhood guitar heroes. And um when they emailed me the day and said listen Joe's going to be in town, um we want you to go to the Hyde Park Hotel um um and film him and do an interview and I was like through the moon ecstatic. And then at uh, last minute they kind of said listen Joe was going to be between um sound check and the hotel so he's not going to have an amp with him he'll have his guitar but can you guys please bring an amp and it was the last minute so we I didn't have like a high gain amp that I could quickly get to take with me to the interview 
So the friend of mine who came with me, he kind of had like a Fender style boutique amp and his pedal board was very much like a bluesy tone. It wasn't a high, dri high drive, high gain kind of tone that Joe Satriani is used, uh, uh, you know, that he's quite well known for. It was just a super bluesy tone. But we set it all up and I was a little bit nervous because I thought, oh, when he's going to play, he's going to want to have his um, really, you know, uh, high gain sound that he's normally using at his gigs. And the moment he picked up his guitar, he instantaneously just sounded like him. Even though it was not the kind of amp he, he plays through, it was not the kind of pedals he plays through, but he sounded like him. And you know, that's where that saying, people always say, um, tone is in the fingers. Um, I really got to experience that firsthand that day when I realized, wow, the tone is in that guy's fingers um, on all of us. So the best thing that you can really do for your tone Obviously, basics, get it down, a guitar that's in tune, intonation taken care of, um, whether you use an amp or a, a device like a Line 6 Helix or a Podgo or a HX Stomp or a Kemper Profiler or whatever you use, get the basics for compression, delay, drive, reverb, all those kind of things. But then go and work on your technique because here's why. The more you work on your technique, the more you're gonna trust yourself when you play. And the more you can trust yourself, the more you're gonna dig into the strings in a healthy way, and the better, with more confidence, you dig into the strings, the better it's gonna sound. So that is one tone tip for you that you can use to improve your tone, but uh, without actually needing to buy any new gear. So, Aaron, hopefully that helps. Um, keep us posted how that is going for you with that strat in your worship team. And uh, Rico is asking, how long have I been playing guitar? Um, I started playing in, I believe, 1994. I started playing bass guitar in 93. So that 03, 13, 23, that'll be 30, close to 30 years. I guess next year will be 30 years that I've been playing. So it's all quite a while, but um, yeah, that's it. Obviously, I don't play all day, every day. I wish I did, but um, Sometimes you don't have like 30 years of experience. You have a couple of years experience over and over, right? So, but for me, that's been a, a three decade journey to date. We've got Charlie Gomez saying, hey, hey, Charles. And then Aaron Davis says, uh, tone is delay and reverb. Yeah, that's a very important, you know, even for singers, they like to have a bit of reverb on their voice, you know, for that sound to, re to really come through. Um, so that makes obviously a big difference on the guitar and one thing in worship obviously they talk about a lot is stacking drives um, but you also stack your delays and in this kind of tone that i've got here um, i wouldn't be able to do it now because i've programmed it for both delays to come on and off at the same time but i've got both a quad delay and and a dual delay and then when you start playing then obviously that delay really makes a very big difference. All right, guys, so the simple gist of today's lesson, I'll quickly go back to the iPad and just remind you, the same three notes that you can play in a vertical position like that, you can also find them in a horizontal position. So go ahead and try and just think through that um, process when you are breaking up um, your, your playing and then um, the good thing is you can start here, go up high and go up higher, or you can start here, go low, come back and go high. You can really uh, do so many things with it. And you don't always have to do just one string. I'll just quickly show you that as well. So if I do G, oh sorry, the C major chord, I can play C, E, G like this. Sorry. But I can also do it like this. So what does that mean? I'll just quickly show you. Um, I can take, let's do different colors. So you can just see that one. Uh, C, E, this is a G right there. And let's get rid of these um, lines. Okay, so that is a G right there as well. My doctor handwriting always kicks in here when we do this. Right, so now I've got 
let's do and let's do the counts. I got one way where I can play like that. I've got a second way where I go across the strings. I've got a third way where I go G string, B string, B string. Okay? And I've got a third way which is G, G, B. So even just with that, the combinations, I've got four different combinations. See, I can play. Or all on one string. Or two strings. Or swap them. Of course you can do the same same thing there as well I mean the, the options are endless but it's just good to have options at your disposal when it comes to what you are going to be doing over there so um, Rico is asking me what's my favorite pedal that I can't play without so these days I just use um, like I said all the stuff is in the Kemper, um, and soon we're going to be doing Helix patches. So um, for me, it's more about an effect than, than a pedal. And obviously, I'm just going to assume that you should have a good drive, you should have a good amp. But I would say delay. You know, that makes such a big difference, especially in a worship setting, kind of makes stuff sound um, a little bit different. So delay would be the effect that I can't play without. Um, and then obviously reverb and drive, those are the other two that um, would be a close second over there. And then Charlie, uh, Charlie is saying, I don't have that shimmer on my pedal board. What do you recommend I use? More delay or more reverb to fill the atmosphere more? That's a great question. So let me show you on this tone of mine. This is with delay and reverb. <laughs> This is just reverb, I've taken the delay off. Now it's dry. Now it's just delay with no reverb. it is going to be reverb added. So, um, unfortunately it's out of focus there, but I've got the Jet Pedal Revelation Reverb, um, which is really one of my favorite pedals to use. Um, we'll put the link in the description if you guys want to pick that up. But the, the Jet Pedal, and we also did a review on that on this channel, um, so you can go and see that has a lot of that shimmery effects in one of the um, the patches, one of the, um, not the patches, but the presets will give you a lot of that. So it's it's interesting because you could probably hear it in, in my reverb only sound. So it's a big reverb, but there's also some delay involved in that. So, and you can also put some re reverb on your actual delays, so... Um, so for me, it's kind of a combination of those two. And Charlie, what I would recommend is we did a video where I did this big ambient tone breakdown. Um, and I also did this, obviously. Also did my dirty sound uh, breakdown so you can actually see what made those different uh, the differences so feel free to check that out Charlie and then Rico is saying um, do I really need to study music theory to be a good guitarist um, I would say yes because I always tell my students at our Wish Guitar Skills Academy that it's not just about being a good guitarist but it's about being a good musician which is a difference right 
but then it doesn't end there. It's not just about being a good musician. It's being, it's about being a good worshiper in spirit and truth and to actually see how do we use our skills in a worship context. So to your question, music theory will help you to know that when I say a C triad, um, you know, those, that's where I find my notes. It's C, E, G. So it's good to know that because then I can play C, E, G, C, E, G, C, E, G. So that's obviously an arpeggio if I want to do E minor. So it's important to, to be able to know where those chords come from. Or if I say this is a C, then I'm going to go to a sus, you know, a sus uh, area. Uh, C sus, then you want to know what is a sus, what is a suspended chord, right? They say the holiest chord is G sus. All right, that's a common guitar, a dad, Christian dad joke, right? Who plays guitar, G sus. So um, it's important to know music theory because then you, you, you can, the guitar, a piano is black and white. You can see the patterns immediately in front of you. On a guitar, you don't really see the um the pattern because you've got repeated notes and all that kind of stuff so music theory will help you to understand the language of music but you don't need to learn complicated jazz harmony or the harmonic minor modes and you know there's a bunch of stuff that you don't need just learn the basics intervals chord construction how to create scales the names of the notes um and then you know how to embellish your chords progressions, even just starting with those few basic things will make a big difference for you, Rico. All right, and Charlie saying mucho, muchas gracias. Thank you, Charlie. And then um, Scooter500 says, what's your secret for preventing music theory from becoming overwhelming? Yeah, the secret there for me is less is more. Less is more. Um, like I said, you just want to learn those basics. If I say an interval of a second or a third or a fourth, you want to know what the intervals are, and an interval is simply the distance between two notes. So that was a second. You want to know how chords are built. So if I say C major, seven, then you want to know it's C, E, G, B. So you just want to know chord construction. And if I say a one, six, two, five progression in G, you want to know it's, it's G, E minor, A minor, D. So it's a natural numbering system. So even if you just know those few things, intervals, chord construction, natural numbering system, that's already a good start. And it's, it's useful to know how, um, how scales are made, like the, the formula for a major scale, the difference between a major scale and a major pentatonic scale. So the basic scales, major, minor, and your pentatonics, and obviously triads. Triads is like the glue that holds everything together, learning how those work in music theory. So um, yeah, that, that will help you. Uh, Rico is asking, am I music director too at our local church? Yes, I am. So in that regard, some Sundays I double up as an MD, the music director, and it's really just about guiding the band through, all right, we've got this coming up, we've got that coming up, whatever the case may be. So um, yeah, that is, that is uh, something to, to pay attention to as well. Um, and it helps to understand music theories so if a chord is not right, or if you want to reharmonize, what if we do the six minor there instead of the, the four or whatever, right? You can, that's useful to know. And uh, Jeff says, uh, when you learn music theory, it helps you to understand how people write songs. So yeah, that's so true. If you know how the song has been written that you're trying to learn, that um, really makes things uh, you know, a lot easier as well. And then we've got one of my old students, Marcel Vermeulen, saying, nice to still be learning from you, Charles. Um, yeah, Marcel had lessons with me, I think it was probably close to 30 years ago, 25 years ago or something. So awesome to see you here on the live stream. Thanks for tuning in. All right, so we kind of at the back end of our live stream. Um, hopefully it's useful to, you to see how you can think across the neck. It helps you to get out of the boxes um, to play all across the guitar neck and um, hopefully it's been useful getting some questions to all these answers. Great questions. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in and for asking. And um, what we've got, let me just see, we've got two things that I'd love for you guys to help me out with. 
Um, the first one is, if you go to worshipguitarskills.com forward slash questions, and we'll make sure to actually go ahead and put that in the description box after the stream. If you have any questions at any time, go there, ask the questions, then we can see them and we'll be able to address them on future episodes. So any questions you have about playing guitar, worship, gear, whatever the case may be, they're all welcome. And then for those of you watching live and even if you're watching the replay, if you can go to worshipguitarskills.com forward slash feedback. It's going to have a couple of quick questions for you. We'd love to know how um, you found the stream, what was useful, um, if there's anything we can improve, any other things you'd like to see in future, um, because we are making this for you guys. Um, we want to make sure that it's super useful and helpful for you, that it will help you to become a equip and empower you to be, like I said, not just a guitarist, not just a musician, but a true worshiper in spirit and truth, because when we as musicians can learn to release that sound, it draws people in the congregation into those moments of worship, and when we are ministering to the Lord, amazing things happen. We read about that in the in the Bible, what happened when uh, David played and Saul calmed down and, you know, um, the Israelites marching around Jericho and, you know, sound is such a powerful thing. Um, and when we as guitar players and as worshipers learn how to, to do that in a way that invites congregation in to worship the Lord and experience His love, His touch and His embrace, you are literally changing lives and you are changing eternity. And that is why we want to work on our skills, why we want to work, make sure our gear is tuned in, it's working fine, um, because there's a great reward at the end of that. And like the Bible, Bible says, um, the harvest is, is ripe, but the laborers are few, and um, we can get to use what we love, which is music and guitar, and use that um, to serve our local community. So guys, thank you so much. If you can take a moment for to fill out that feedback for us um, after we end this show uh, for today. If you have any more questions, uh, let us know in the comments. Um, sometimes we have a little bit of a delay, so we don't always get to them live in case they come on after we've um, ended the stream. But yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for watching. Um, honor you for tuning in, for working on your playing. And if there's any way, shape or form that we can help you become a better guitarist, musician and worshipper, reach out. We are here on YouTube. You can find us at worshipguitarskills.com. And um, as always, in the links of our videos, we'll have um, additional uh, links to resources and so forth. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you guys back here next Tuesday with our usual YouTube video of the week. And then we'll see you um, next Thursday for another live stream. Unless it's... Um, Easter, I don't have my dates quite right, but we'll obviously send out emails for that. And you guys can just go to thatworshipguitarshow.com if you want to sign up to um, our notification list. We'll let you know whenever we are doing episodes. And we also send out our weekly newsletter with a bunch of resources. All right, so Scooter500 saying thank you. Charlie Gomez waving. Guys, have a lovely weekend. Enjoy. Um, we'll see you. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, Jeff. Um, I think it's the US time zone. So um, uh, Jeff is one of our Academy members. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And um, yeah, that's a great one, guys. Much love. Have a good one. And we'll chat soon. Bye-bye.